how does a concussion actually work? To zoom out for a second, I, th I think one of the reasons why we have really failed to produce consistent therapies or reproducible therapies for concussions is because we don't study them properly. And we don't study them properly because we don't understand them properly. Hard to fix when you can't define. Exactly. And so what is normally done, or the, when people think about a concussion, and if you read papers, you'll still see this um, consistently. You're experts in the field talking about it. You'll, you'll hear something like the slosh effect. Um, or you know, you imagine a head getting bashed and then like the brain banging around inside the skull, like hitting one side of what hitting one side of the skull, then banging and, and hitting the other side. And that's what they call a contra coup injury, which is basically you see some injury on the opposite side from, from where the impact occurred. The brain is, you know, it, it's mainly fat and water, and it is then surrounded by fluid and it's inside a solid box. And that fluid is full of salt. That fluid is full of salt. If you take a solid box full of water, even if it's got something very fragile inside, and you shake it really hard, that fragile thing does not bang against the sides because the water is right buffers it or the you know the CSF or the the fluid. I saw you do this. Yeah, it was the one of the coolest things <laughs> I've ever seen. You took an egg and you put it in a jar with salt water. I don't remember the concentration you put it. Oh, in. it was just like normal yeah, normal saline. Yeah, and you you know, screw the top of a ball jar or whatever it was, yeah. and you shook the living crap out of the egg and the yolk didn't break. Yeah. At all. No. Because it's not hitting anything. No. It's smashed it, it together. Stays right in the, it stays right in the middle. I w I, in that moment, I went, I, I, pff, what? <laughs> like everything, because I had said that always. Yeah. I did not know that until you showed me that. Yeah. Not me, but you're showing other people. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, wow. So if, if you could, while I'm shaking it, image the jar, what you would see is you would see distortions um, along the surface of the egg yolk inside inside this jar. So there are distortions. So the egg, instead of being a perfect circle, turns yeah. into an oval. Yeah. It's not smashing against yeah. the wall. It's just being distorted and, and it's being um, accordioned. Exactly. Squished and, and pulled yeah. back apart, right. So how we generally study concussions is the other version of, of the egg experiment, which I also showed, which is that you have your, your egg yolk in your solution and you leave a big chunk of air in the top of the jar. You shake that, immediately it turns into salad dressing, right? Yep. Immediately you, you disperse that egg yolk th throughout the liquid. That's how we normally study concussion. But what happens um, if you then look at where injury is in people who've had concussion? So like you look at individuals who have uh, CTE, right? They probably have some ongoing history of concussions. It's happened multiple times. If you look at where the injury has accumulated, it's not at the surface of of the brain. It's not the brain banging against the skull. What's happening is that these distortions, like waves of energy that are transferred through the brain, is at the interfaces of different parts of the brain. So particularly the interfaces between the gray matter on the outside and the white matter underneath. It's connective tissue. Yeah. They're tearing the connective Yeah. So right at the usually right at the base of the sulci. So you think about the brain is really wrinkly, right? Those are the gyri. The the sort of the divots in between mm -hmm. those wrinkles, the sulci, at the base of those, that's where you tend to see uh, injury. And it's because you have uh, tissues of different densities where then the distortion travels at different rates. So yep. then you create this shearing effect at those interfaces. And then that's right. And if the shearing effect is very large, you can rip axons, you, you so create direct, direct axonal injury. Um, if it's a blast wave, then obviously you're not directly shearing anything, but you still you still seem to injure those same areas because the energy wave is transferring through the brain at, at different rates. And so that's where the injury uh, accumulates is at, the, at those interfaces. So then how do things like creatine and lactate uh, help? Do they work at all? And if so, how? I've been uh, really excited about the potential for lactate in traumatic brain injury, and, and that uh, excitement aligns very similarly to with ketones. Um, but people have been talking about them for a long time, and I'm still waiting for some yeah. good some good human studies. I've uh, been probably talking about it for a decade <laughs> yeah. online, like in yeah. front of people on podcasts and things like that. Yeah. So I, b I believe that they could be beneficial, yeah. but we just haven't seen really high-quality evidence yet. However, now that's clear. Yeah. We haven't seen evidence that shows they don't work either. No, just studies just aren't being yeah. done. No, no. Yeah. And if if I were to get 
uh, a significant concussion or TBI, like I'm going straight to the ketone esters because I believe that there's a high chance of benefit with low risk. Anybody who's like, I, I don't have a randomized controlled trial to tell you that that's the case, but you know, I, I think it, it could be your brain, If it was my brain, that's, that's what I would do. As an MD, PhD <laughs> in brain health, this is what you would do. So, Infer that for what you will, folks. Uh, part of it is that it's essentially providing uh, some kind of metabolic substrate in an area of the brain where there is impaired metabolism. So one of the consistent responses you see to an acute brain injury, and again, strokes, cardiac arrests, dramatic brain injuries, is what we call energy failure. So there's this uh, gap between energy requirements and energy supply because you have dysfunctional mitochondria. Ketones and lactate can kind of bypass some of that and seem to be um, less uh, le less energy energetically expensive, or they're more energetically efficient in terms of generating ATP. Like the effect is small, but in that kind of setting, a, a small effect uh, may you know, may be enough to help to help minimize injury. There's also going to be some other signaling effects that that could that could be beneficial, um, like both lactate and ketones have a whole range of other um, anti-inflammatory um, neurotrophic kind of effects. So, so lactate seems to help, and ketones seem to help drive an increase in production in BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which could help uh, recovery. So beyond their effect on um, your metabolism, they may have these other downstream uh, effects as well. But another reason why this is important is that in the acute uh, injury setting, the, the brain may become relatively uh, insensitive to glucose or glucose uptake decreases. So, um, but that doesn't seem to be the case because the, the transporter is different and both ketones and lactate go in through the monocarboxylate transporters, which aren't necessarily affected in that state. So some of it could be that particularly ketones might be more um, uh, metabolically efficient in terms of energy production, but also they're maybe more likely to get into the brain in the setting of, a, of an acute injury to help support are they production. potentially less negatively influenced by inflammatory markers as well? Um, yes, potentially. Although, I mean, it kind of depends on what's, what's going on and how they're getting in. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode by clicking here. <laughs>